Well, good morning, Stafford Baptist Church and visitors. It is good to gather with you this morning to, to give praise to the Word of God made flesh, Jesus Christ. In case I haven't met you yet, my name is, is Kelton. I have the privilege of, of serving as one of the pastors here of Stafford Baptist Church. I'd invite you to please stick around after service so we have a chance to, to greet you today. If you would, though, please open your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. We will be studying verses 22 through 37 this morning. Words reveal the heart. Matthew 12, 22 through 37. In our sermon last week, the Pharisees confronted Jesus about his observance of the Sabbath. And in that passage, Jesus declared himself Lord of the Sabbath and, and showed himself to be the prophesied servant, dealing gently with the bruised and weak, that he offers rest from the burden of legalistic demand. Well, this week in our passage, Jesus' confrontation with the Pharisees continues, though now on a, a different issue. But before we go any further, we should pause to ask for God's help in our hearing and for uh, His help in the proclaiming of His Word. So please, I'd invite you to, to make this prayer your own, and if you agree with me, join with me in saying amen at the end. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, by your Word, the heavens were created. Your Word, what, what you speak, is true and has power. So we pray that as we come to your word this morning, that you would work your power in us. Your word is living and active, discerning the thoughts and intentions of our hearts. So we pray, Father, reveal to us our hearts by your word and the forgiveness for our hearts in Jesus. And now let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord our rock, and our redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. I find this hard to believe, but research shows that the average person speaks from 10,000 to 20,000 words per day. If you were to put 20,000 words into a paper, single-spaced, that would be a 40-page paper every single day. And at that rate, saying you start speaking at the normal rate, maybe around the age of three or four, by the time you are 80 years old, you will have spoken more than 550 million words. 550 million words. You know, you can imagine if we had a court stenographer just following us around everywhere we go, recording every word we speak to be compiled into what becomes our our life works. Well, that record would fill 14 complete sets of the 32 volumes of the Encyclopedia Britannica. 14 sets of 32 volumes. Well, obviously, no one would have time to read all that. That would take itself another lifetime. Well, instead, maybe, maybe we can make a word cloud out of it, right? You know, one of those images of words where the size of the word indicate its frequency. So ignoring all those common prepositions and whatnot, what, what words might be biggest on your word cloud? You know, our, our words are more than just sounds that communicate. Jesus says our words come from the overflow of our heart. Whatever our hearts are full of, our mouths speak. Your words Reveal your heart. What do your words say about your heart? You know, our, our words are one of the most important aspects of our life, live before God and, and others, and, and are one of the best indicators of our maturity and growth in Christ likeness, or indicators of, of its absence. In our passage this morning, Jesus takes opportunity to teach us about our words. The Pharisees in this passage will speak blasphemous words against Jesus, attributing his works to Satan. And Jesus says that all of our words show us what is in our hearts, who we truly 
are. So let's read together. Brothers and sisters, Jesus teaching us about our hearts in Matthew 12, starting in verse 22. Then a demon-oppressed man who was blind and mute was brought to him, and he healed him so that the man spoke and saw. And all the people were amazed and said, Can this be the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, It is only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this man casts out demons. Knowing their thoughts, he said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and no city or house divided against itself will stand. And if Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore they will be your judges. But if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or how can someone enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man? Then indeed he may plunder his house. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. Therefore I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven people, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. And whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or the age to come. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for the tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good person, out of his good treasure, brings forth good. And the evil person, out of his evil treasure, brings forth evil. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. The grass wither, the flower falls, but the word of the Lord endures forever. What's, what's the main point of this passage? What is Jesus trying to teach us in a sentence? Well, I think it's this. Be careful with your words. Your words reveal your heart, and your heart determines your fate. Be careful with your words, brothers and sisters. Your words reveal your heart and your heart determines your fate. Our passage this morning contains 286 words of Jesus in the English that he uses to refute the Pharisees and, and teach us about the power of, of our words. Our words have eternal importance, even be used, being used as evidence in our final judgment. So be careful with your words. Your words reveal your heart and your heart determines your fate. This morning we're going to break from the normal mold a little bit. We won't have any particular points today. I just want to point out that the text has a pretty easy outline. Right In verse 22 we have a miracle, a demon cast out. Verse 23 we have one response to that miracle. And in verse 24 a second response. And the rest of our passage, 25 through 37, is Jesus' speech. His teaching on the subject in light of those two different responses to his miracle. So let's look back at verse 22 and the healing that sets this all in motion. A miracle that restores a man's speech. Words once more, if you will. You'll remember in this story before, Jesus had been healing the crowds that followed him. You can look at that back in verse 15. Many followed him. He healed them all. At some indistinct time later, we find in verse 22, a demon-oppressed man is brought to Jesus. Because of this demon, the man had physical disabilities. He was unable to, to see or, or to speak. All throughout Jesus' ministry, he has been healing the demon-oppressed. Maybe the most famous example that we've studied in the book of Matthew, you'll remember, is Jesus healing two men by casting out demons into the nearby pigs that then rushed down the hill. That's back in, in the end of chapter 8. 
But that's just one example. All throughout Matthew, we have seen Jesus casting out demons, healing those who are demon-oppressed. It's a, a mark of his, his ministry, and here he does it again. But when earlier stories gave us a lot of details about those healings, here we just have a, a simple report. In verse 22, the man was blind and mute, brought to Jesus, healed, and he could speak and see once more. Words once more. The, the emphasis is clearly here not on the miracle, but, but how the people respond in verses 23 and 24, and what Jesus says about those responses in 25 and following. So in verse 23, our next verse, we have first words of wonder. It says, all the people were amazed. They, they were astonished. Even though Matthew moves on quickly from this, let's not miss this. It is amazing that Jesus had the power to heal the blind and the mute. He had a authority over spiritual powers like it was nothing. Ho-hum. I'd encourage you, brothers and sisters, to wake up your hearts this morning and join the crowds and be amazed by Jesus. His miracles, what he does here in verse 22, is a signpost to who he is. God incarnate. The Messiah sent to save us from our sins. The crowds there in verse 23 ask a particular question. Can this be the son of David? If you'll remember the beginning of Matthew, we, we as readers of this book know the answer to this question. Matthew began with the conclusion in first verse, chapter 1, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, who? The son of David, the son of Abraham. Matthew highlighted in his account of Jesus' birth that Joseph was a descendant of David. Luke reports that Jesus was born in Bethlehem, right? The city of David because Joseph was of the line, the lineage of, of David. But the crowds here aren't, aren't particularly wondering about his lineage, who is his father. They, they ask this in response to his miracles because they had expectations about a, a particular son of David. You'll recall from your Old Testament, David was a king of Israel, but he was promised a son to reign on the throne forever. In 2 Samuel 7, uh, verses 12 and 16, God promises to David, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever, God promises to David. So Jews have been waiting on that promise ever since. David had a long line of sons on the throne, but eventually that line failed. And now no king sat on the throne of David. We, we actually sang of this hope earlier in our service. You know, I, I wonder if you ever sing something and wonder, what did I just sing? Well, in, in verse 2 of what we sang earlier, Come thou long expected Jesus, we sang, Come thou promised rod of Jesse. Well, well what's a rod of Jesse? Well, rod of Jesse comes from Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1. Rod is the, the KJV way of translating a branch. Uh, Isaiah 11, 1 says, There shall come forth a shoot, a branch from the stump of Jesse. Who, who is Jesse? Well, Jesse is David's father. It is predicting that the tree of Jesse will bring forth another branch in the line of David. It goes on, and a branch from his root shall bear fruit, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. So when the, the Jews see the spirit acting in this man, they wonder, is this the rod of Jesse? Is this the branch that comes from the tree of Jesse? Is this the promised son of David? Their hopes are ignited as they display a power that must be from God. It must be the spirit of God. Or maybe they're puzzled. They expected this son of David to come more like David as a warrior king, to conquer physical kingdoms like their Roman oppressors, not spiritual ones like, like demons. 
Now, either way, Matthew 12, they see evidence and exclaim words of wonder, words of wonder. But in verse 24, we have a second response, the opposite reaction, wicked words, wicked words. The the Pharisees, Jesus' sparring partners, heard of the miracle. And they respond not by associating his power with God as a son of David, with the Spirit, but now with, with Satan. They claim there in verse 24 that, that his power to cast out demons comes from Beelzebul, the prince of demons. Beelzebul is, is simply the Greek name for the devil, for, for Satan, for the ruler of fallen angels. You know, they they recognize that his supernatural power, his supernatural acts requires supernatural power. And if they're not going to admit that it's divine from God by the Spirit, then there is only one alternative. They must say it is of Satan. It is demonic. Wicked words. Well, that's it. That's the scene. The rest of our passage this morning is Jesus' response to these two two responses. It it says in verse 25 that Jesus knew their thoughts. Their their words were public, right? They were trying to counter the messianic interpretation of his miracles. But, But Jesus knew more than just their words. It says he knew their thoughts. He knew what motivated, why they were saying these things. And he'll address that in time. But first, he begins with the simplest point, first logical words. Verses 25 through 27 are a simple logical argument to refute the Pharisees with plain reason. What they're saying doesn't stand up even to common sense. You'll notice in these verses, he doesn't reference himself at all in verses 25 and 26. This is an argument that anyone could make. He uses there the imagery of a kingdom divided against itself. You you think of something like America during the Civil War. A kingdom with internal divisions will not stand. This is plain to all. So he asks, how then could Satan cast, how could he cast out demons by Satan? If Satan is casting out his own demons, his kingdom would fall. No, the the Pharisees' claim doesn't stand up even to common sense. Jesus tacks on a more personal note there in verse 27 to his logical words. He asks rhetorically, by whom do your sons cast out demons? Jesus is referring to to other Jews, not the the Pharisees' literal children, but but Jews had, had their own exorcists. Do the Pharisees want to follow their own logic? If Jesus does this by Satan, then the Jews are as well. It's a a simple argument here in these verses, but but frankly, irrefutable. If you're joining us this morning and, and you're not a Christian, thank you for being with us. Have you ever considered that your assessment of Jesus, of the evidence for Christianity, might not be reasonable? You know, we live in an age that places ultimate value on logic and reason. Reason, we think, can be, can be totally neutral. Only reason can be trusted as a, a reliable source of knowledge. But I want you to notice here, the Pharisees abandon what is reasonable to serve themselves. You know, many non-theists would say that their assessment of the evidence leads to their unbelief. What Jesus is teaching here, what Christians would say, is that in fact, our unbelief determines our assessment of the evidence. We, on our own, dismiss Jesus without any good reason. In fact, contrary to what is truly reasonable. People reject Jesus not because it is reasonable, but because our reason is flawed by our sin. We come to conclusions that best serve us. You know, your objections to Jesus might not be the same as the Pharisees here, but don't believe the lie that reason is an impartial arbiter. No, we are blind to the truth. We often hold to illogical positions, just like the Pharisees here, because of something much deeper, something in our heart. And Jesus is going to show us just that in a moment. 
But first, he presents a counterclaim. Logical words and now proven words. Look at verse 28. If instead of Satan, he casts out demons by the Holy Spirit, well then, the kingdom of God has come. He's not necessarily here arguing that he is casting out demons by the Holy Spirit, right? He leaves that to you if, he says, decide for yourself. But if indeed it is by the Holy Spirit, well then the kingdom of God has come. Obviously we read this in the context of the rest of the book of Matthew. We conclude for ourselves what we studied last week, right? In verse 18. That Jesus fulfills Isaiah 42, the promise of the beloved servant who has God's spirit. So if it is by the spirit that he does this, it is evidence that the kingdom of God has come. The the kingdom of God is, is the reign of God, bringing his people back into submission to their king and creator. So Jesus' authority here by the spirit for all those who have eyes to see is that he is the coming king with all supernatural authority, all authority on heaven and on earth. No one has ever carried out such miracles with such decisive authority, leaving the crowds amazed, his fame spreading throughout the land. So these miracles prove that he is the one anointed by the Holy Spirit, bringing in the long-awaited kingdom of David's son to reign on his throne forever. I think the point of verse 28 is to draw us to a sense of urgency. The kingdom has come. It it is here. Will you enter? Friends, that that kingdom is is still here. It is is still coming. It is still calling people to submit to their king. We this morning gather as as citizens of of that kingdom waiting for its consummation. And our task as we wait is to go and tell, to compel more, to to know the king, that the kingdom might be filled. Yes, the, the evidence is conclusive. This is the king who came to deliver us from the domain of darkness, that is Satan's kingdom, to the kingdom of the beloved son. As he goes on to say, every sin will be forgiven people in his kingdom. This evidence demands a verdict, proven words. But to, to better understand his mission, Jesus next describes it with a picture. And it's, it's precisely the opposite of what the Pharisees claim. So, so next, starting in verse 29, picture words. We have the scene here of a man entering a strong man's house. If that man wants to enter the plunder of the house, he must first tie up the strong man. Well, Jesus doesn't elaborate on the picture, but the context makes it clear. Jesus is the man who came to plunder the strong man's house. Satan is the strong man. His goods, what Jesus comes to plunder, are the people that he has possessed and oppressed. And Jesus has bound the strong man. As strong as Satan might be, he falls to the strength of Jesus. And now Jesus is free to go about the house, taking the plunder as he wills. So far from colluding with Satan, as the Pharisees say, Jesus is mounting a direct assault on Satan's house. Jesus has defeated the devil's temptations in the wilderness. Jesus has an unrivaled authority over Satan. That man is is bound, unable to make any defense. The truth is you are either in the possession of the strong man or delivered by the invading power. So this picture word leads us right into the next claim in verse 30, dividing words. Dividing words. Just like you can either be in the possession of the strong man or delivered by the invading power, you can either be with Jesus in verse 30 or against him. There is no neutral territory in this kingdom warfare. Jesus makes a universal claim. Whoever is not with him is therefore against him. And to be with him is not just to receive the miracles, to be freed from demonic oppression. It requires a particular assessment of those miracles. 
What is their source? Who is this Jesus? Where is he from? And what will I do with that information? Will I join him or remain against him? The Pharisees, though we don't have any reason to think they're demon oppressed, make their position clear. They are against Jesus. The crowds still wonder. But with these dividing words, Jesus offers a way to come over, as it were, to, to throw down our weapons of opposition and submit to the king with his next words of hope. Words of hope. Look at the first part of verse 31. Therefore, I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven people. Don't rush to the next phrase yet. That'd be like skipping over the billion dollar account balance to read the fine print below. This is amazing news. Every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven. Sins that deserve death and eternal wrath. In the words that we read earlier, Micah 7, 19, they will be like rocks cast into the depth of the sea, lost in the darkness where we can never find them again. Your anger, your greed, your selfishness, those shameful thoughts, that coldness to the glory of God, men's slander, envy, pride and, and violence. Yes, even that thing that you're thinking of. If we somehow played video of it on the screen, you wouldn't believe you could ever show your face here again. Jesus knows. Jesus sees. And read verse 31 again. Every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven people. Don't take this for granted, brothers and sisters. This morning, take it like a, a firebrand and press it onto your conscience. There is forgiveness for sins, for your sins. The sins of, of all those who have trusted in Jesus have been laid on Jesus at the cross. You know, Jesus lived a life of, of perfect obedience to God, always using his words to bless and heal others. To speak for the glory of God, but for our sake. He made him to be sin, who knew no sin. Taking on himself our sins, he suffered the punishment that we deserve for our sins. God's good anger against our evil. Jesus died so that we would not face death. And he rose again that we would have eternal life. And this he gives to us as a gift of grace. Not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. So friends, even if you've heard that news 10,000 times, would you please pause to be amazed by it again? Can you say from your heart this morning, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. It is no less good news today, a forgiveness from today's sin than when you first heard it, however long ago that was. And this news deserves to be the marrow of your heart, the very center of what engages your attention and motivates you every day. You know, the heart of a genuine Christian should overflow with gratitude for the gospel. An overflow that should show up in our, our very speech. But, but we're getting ahead of ourselves. There is the second half of verse 31 and then 32. Jesus pairs his words of hope now with words of warning. Words of warning. Yes, every sin and blasphemy finds forgiveness in the sacrifice of Jesus for sins. That includes, even in verse 32, blasphemy, words spoken against Jesus. But, he says, blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. This statement has caused some confusion and, and for some even despair. Some wonder if they've inadvertently 
committed this unforgivable sin and, and that now all hope is lost. But I, I think most of that confusion and despair is caused by removing this verse from, from its context. The fact is that, that nowhere else in Scripture does it speak of this unforgivable sin except other places in Jesus that the other Gospels record this same teaching. Neither in the Old Testament nor in, in the New in fact, the Bible is filled with comprehensive offers of forgiveness. Repent, believe, and you will be saved. Your sins blotted out. So we have to read how Jesus uses it carefully this morning. In context, the Pharisees had just attributed his miracles to the power of Satan. Works that were in fact by the power of the Holy Spirit. So to blaspheme the Spirit... In context, is to say that his work, the Spirit's work, is from Satan. It is to call the Spirit Satan. And not only that, to, but to maintain that assertion despite all evidence. Remember, this is not the first time that the Pharisees have said that Jesus' work comes from Satan. Right? Back in, in Matthew 9, 34, after another mute man was healed of a demon, they said he casts out demons by the prince of demons. No, this, this blasphemy of the Spirit is unforgivable because it is an outright denial and rejection of Jesus Christ and the Spirit. It is a settled opposition. And of course, no one opposed to Jesus can receive forgiveness of sins. Forgiveness of sins is only possible for those who confess Jesus as Lord, who trust Him as completely reliable. So I would say that blasphemy against the Spirit is, is not so much a specific sin, but the state of sin. Rebellion against God and, and blindness to Him, calling Him Satan. So put simply, this is not a, a sin that Christians, genuine Christians, are, are capable of committing. But for those who are like the Pharisees in a state of settled opposition to Jesus, there is no forgiveness, not in this age nor in the age to come, he says. Because there is no other name under heaven by which we may be saved. Brothers and sisters, Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. So we have in Jesus' words here two great truths in his words of hope and words of warning. First, Jesus forgives every sin. But second, forgiveness is only found in Jesus. Jesus forgives every sin, but forgiveness is only found in Jesus. You cannot be opposed to Jesus and have your sins forgiven. And what reveals your posture towards Jesus, he says? Well, it's your words. To speak blasphemy, comes from a heart settled in opposition to Jesus. So in verses 33 through 35, Jesus takes us to the root of the Pharisees' blasphemous words, revealing words, revealing words. It, it might have a paragraph break in your Bibles, but Jesus is continuing his speech in response to the Pharisees' claim all the way through 37. He hasn't stopped. But now he's less concerned with, with their blasphemy and refuting that claim but now where those words came from and, and what they reveal about the Pharisees and us. Words like blasphemy, but, but so many others. First, in verse 33, he uses the image of a fruit tree. His command there, make the tree good, is, is to change the tree. You can't just change the fruit and think it's good. Good fruit only comes from a good tree. You know, you can't go to a, a rotting apple tree, staple fresh apples to its branches, and voila, a good tree. No, the tree needs to be transformed from the roots up. The only remedy for evil, blasphemous words is a radical change of heart. In verse 34, he calls them a brood of vipers with deadly venom in their mouths. They cannot make good fruit. They cannot speak good if they are bad trees, if they have evil hearts. 
The end of verse 34 might be one of the most penetrating observations among the many of Jesus' ministry. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The Pharisees' blasphemous words come from an evil heart. Our hearts, our affections, our thoughts, our desires are like a river in the springtime. Flooding its banks into the the plains. The floodwaters come from the source, the river. Or to put it another way, our our tongues are like wind socks at the airport. They don't turn the wind, right? They only indicate where the wind is blowing. So our tongues are like the wind socks of our hearts, wagging in the direction of whatever is flowing out of our hearts. Our hearts control our actions. Not only what you say, but but what you do is determined by who you are. And who you are most fundamentally is who you are in your heart. From the smallest, most inconsequential action to the, the biggest, most dramatic reactions or interactions all spring from one and the same source, your heart. Thankful words come from a thankful heart. Words of confession come from a humble heart. Gracious words come from a patient heart. Critical words come from a bitter heart. Complaining words come from a discontent heart. Cutting words come from an angry heart. How many times have you said something that you've instantly regretted? Or after saying it, explaining that that that's not what you really meant. Words reveal the heart. And words spoken over a lifetime reveal whether your heart is evil or good. In verse 35, Jesus uses again the image of a storeroom now, full of treasure. Our hearts are the storeroom of our lives. That's where we store everything. And what we bring out in our speech comes from what is in that storeroom in our hearts. So Stafford Baptist, what do your words indicate about the storeroom of your hearts? Let's bring back our court sonographer recording our our every word. What do your words indicate is occupying, is filling your heart? Are you quick to encourage to give thanks, to speak scripture, to give praise to God? Are you quick to criticize, to anger, to sarcasm? What would the people who are closest to you say about your speech? And what might that indicate fills your heart? I'm sure you're all familiar with the rhyme, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words shall never hurt me. It's usually said in response to the cruel speech from bullies on the playground. It's, it's a noble sentiment, but, but frankly, it's, it's not true. Sure, words don't draw blood like sticks and stones can, but words do hurt. Words can be weapons. We read in, in James 3 earlier that the tongue is a fire. A restless evil full of deadly poison. The the book of Proverbs is full of sayings about our speech. Like in in chapter 12 verse 18. It says there is one whose rash words are like sword thrusts. But the tongue of the wise bring healing. Our words can be like swords and and poison. Bringing pain and, and death. Or they can be like bandages. And medicine, bringing comfort and healing. The the point of what we read earlier in James 3 is to highlight how powerful our tongues are. as, As small as they are in our body. So much of how we impact others for good or for evil is determined by your tongue. By your speech. And that comes from your heart. James goes on to say, if our hearts have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition, well, it will show up in how we live, in disorder, every vile practice. It is the overflow of the heart that determines how we live. 
Case in point, brothers and sisters, the gospel is known and believed through words. Either written or spoken, flowing from the heart of those who themselves are full of the gospel. And there are no more life-giving and and healing words than the good news of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. And how do we learn of that news? Well, God has given us the power to proclaim it with our very own mouths, our very own pens. The heart of the genuine Christian should overflow with gratitude for the gospel. And we should proclaim it with our tongues. So I ask again, brothers and sisters, what impact is your tongue having on the lives around you? Do you often speak of the gospel? What does that indicate occupies your heart? How can you better use your tongue to do good to others? If you want to do good to others with your tongue, it must come from the overflow of your heart. You cannot simply put a muzzle on your tongue and expect to do good. It must come from filling your heart with good things. And obviously, that first requires us to have a good heart. Our hearts are evil by nature, opposed to God from birth. We need a radical transformation. We need the miracle of spiritual rebirth, a heart of flesh given to us from above. Do you have a new heart? given by God, you can have one as as a gift. He makes us new by His Spirit. If you find this morning that you want a new heart, we would love to talk to you about that. Please talk to anyone around you after service. But but even with a new heart, we need to guard it from filling it with with evil and, and positively fill it with good. I wonder, brothers and sisters, what What does your choice of music or TV fill your heart with? Does your heart overflow with complaining because you fill your heart with negative news? Does your heart overflow with indifference towards God because you fill your heart with shows that ignore God? One of the best ways to be proactive about filling your hearts with good is to memorize and meditate on Scripture. Yes, this means more than just read it. Make sure your heart is filled with it before you leave. Maybe pick one verse from what you've read and return to it a few times during the day and in the week to come. I would suggest to get in the habit of of memorizing Scripture, verses or, or longer sections of Scripture, so that you can call them to mind at, at a moment's notice. I was so encouraged, Tangie recently found one of Franklin Taylor's old Bibles in the youth room, where he had highlighted all the verses that he had memorized. And brothers and sisters, he had a lot highlighted. Maybe you can start by memorizing Matthew 12, verse 34, B. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And call that to mind when you are convicted about your words. Or maybe Ephesians 4, 29. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. Friends, fill your hearts. For what fills your hearts controls your life. And Jesus concludes, what controls your life will control your afterlife. In verses 36 and 37, words of judgment. Jesus concludes with the plural, I tell you all, speaking to the whole crowd, drawing the lesson home for us. At the final day, the day of judgment, you will give an account for every careless word you've spoken. How does that change the way you think about what you post on social media? Yes, we we might not have an actual stenographer recording our, our every word, but they are kept in heaven. And we will give an account for them. And why? What use is the words on the day of judgment? Well, he says they will be used to acquit or condemn. By our words, Jesus says we will be either justified or condemned. 
We will either be declared right with God and, and welcomed into eternal life or, or doomed to eternal death because of our opposition to God in light of our words. The evidence of our heart on that day will be our words. Those volumes and volumes and volumes of our words will either give it evidence that yes, our hearts had been transformed by the grace of God or no, they remained settled in opposition to Jesus. And this isn't a denial of justification by faith. No, no, your words do not merit your justification. No, they give evidence of it. Jesus' whole point here is that words reveal the heart. A justified heart made new by God as a gift of His grace, not because you earned it, will overflow in your words. So your words are like an x-ray to the heart and display in black and white the eternal state of your soul. Our words, brothers and sisters, are one of the most important aspects of our life. Not only because they are one of the most significant ways we help and hurt one another, but because they will be the evidence that displays the state of our soul on that day. Brothers and sisters, what evidence will your heart give on that last day? Give ear to Jesus' words today. Jesus speaks here words of eternal life, words that give grace to all who hear. As we come to the table of the Lord's Supper, I would encourage you, brothers and sisters, to let these words of Christ dwell in your heart richly. As we fill our mouths with bread and wine in remembrance of Him, may He fill our hearts. Come to the fount that the overflow of our hearts might be Christ. Be careful with your words. Your words reveal your heart, and your heart determines your fate. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we give you praise for these words of life that are spoken by Jesus to us, that we might know that there is forgiveness for all sins and blasphemies in him, or that he has come to bind the strong men and deliver those who are possessed and oppressed by our enemy Satan, among whom we all once lived in the desires of our flesh. Father, we praise you for the deliverance, the new heart that we have by your Spirit. And Father, we pray that we would now fill our hearts with good things, that out of the good treasure our tongues might speak life and peace and healing. Father, we pray that at that last day our tongues would give evidence of a heart transformed by your grace, moved by your love, first and foremost, to speak of your love to all who would hear. We pray this all in Christ's name. Amen.